We now must transition to our all-star lineup of panelists. As someone who works at the grassroots, I love our grassroots organizers. They have some stories of hope that are not often heard, but need to be heard. Their stories show us what's possible when people take action. They give us an example to follow. Brooks, tell us who we have with us today. Thanks, Michael. I am excited as well by our guests. Let me introduce them to you in the order in which they'll be speaking. First, we'll have Analia Schlager Dos Santos from Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. Analia is the environmental justice oriented youth program coordinator with Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. Her focus there is on designing and running an ongoing youth program that is structured around youth leadership, advocacy, and environmental justice principles. She also helps to bring youth to the state level to engage with environmental policies such as the Green New Deal. Next, we will have Alexa Horwart. Alexa is the lead organizer for Isaiah, a multi-faith, multi-racial, statewide people's organization working to advance racial and economic justice in Minnesota. Alexa has been leading statewide community organizing efforts for a decade focused on small towns and rural communities. She works often on climate justice and caregiving and the intersections of the two. And then our third speaker for today will be Gina Peltier, who is the project developer for Honor the Earth. Gina is from the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa and is a leader and organizer who works with and develops new local leaders, facilitates coalitions, and assists in the development of campaigns. Her work has focused on civic engagement, environmental justice, water protection issues, and voter registration. We're delighted to have all of our panelists with us today. Analia, if you could get us started, that would be terrific. Yeah, can everyone hear me well enough? Cool. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Analia Schlegger Santos. I use she, her, and hers pronouns. Um, my family is Afro-Brazilian, Euro-American. Um, I'm born and raised in North Minneapolis, Minnesota, on Dakota and Anishinaabe land. Um, I was raised in the um, part of our state that has the highest concentration of Black and Brown and low-income folks, um, and also holds the highest asthma rate in the state. So um, I come from what's called an environmental justice community, um, what some call as such, and um, most of my work focuses on this place. And I'm actually sitting right now in the Redeemer Lutheran Church, which is the church I grew up going to. Um, it's the church that I went to all my summer camps with, and I actually have all my youth apprentices are outside, so if you see me uh, look to the side for a second. It's because we are picking up litter right now and planting seeds today for Earth Day. So um, we've got some kids out here in the cold. It is cold. Uh, we had 85 degrees last week, but you know, climate crisis. Um, so I am, um, thank you, Brooks, for the introduction uh, in my daytime role and I guess nighttime and the rest of the days of the week. Um, I hold the role of Environmental Justice Youth Program Director with Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light, um, as well as what I will call the International Environmental Justice Presence Team Lead, which is a party of one for right now. <laughs> but um, I am blessed and honored to be in these spaces and to be focusing not only on my um, community that I came from, but uh, as building global community as well, which is a, an honor. Um, Aside from that, I am the eldest sister. I'm the only daughter. Um, I am uh, on a few boards of organizations that work in a community. Uh, and I have six youth apprentices as a result of my program called Youth in Power. And I don't always know the right things to say. So uh, glad to be here. Um, so my background is in communications and public relations. Um, when I was a young, younger, um, person starting out my, you know, higher education uh, experience, I was trying to figure out what, what it would look like, um, where I'm going to be moving into, 
Um, I started college at the University of South Carolina thinking I would go into international business and forge mergers between companies. And here I am now, <laughs> many years later, um, working in community and working with youth. And um, I actually switched to communications and public relations. And then I left school while shifting work, shifting to work in the environmental justice movement. Um, so I started to see what I could bring to this movement, uh, hopefully, was the my love of genuine, the building and developing of genuine relations between people and themselves, um, and people in their environments, and all of the beings under creation, as well as a joy for working with um, and for young people, and with and in service of community. Um, I felt like I was late to the game when I started environmental justice work, I was 23 years old, and a lot of folks in other orgs that I'm with like make fun of me for saying that I thought I was late at 23, um, but I was the oldest person in my program. I joined the movement from communications, uh, the School of Communications and Business School, um, whereas everyone in my program, my environmental justice program was pursuing degrees in environmental studies this or political science that. Um, so I was considering adding global studies to my sphere of reference, but the this movement met me where I'm at. And so um, this movement, at wherever I joined it, saw me as having an important lived experience that qualified me to be in more places and spaces than I had previously expected as a young person. I think as young folks, we are conditioned to understand that um, once you earn your stripes, you get to hold a position or hold a position in power and make decisions. Oops. Um, you know, only only once you've gotten experience. And so I I feel like I've landed well because this movement met me where I'm at. So I remember in my early 20s, I just turned 28 two weeks ago. So I'm I'm getting up there, y'all. Um, I remember uh when I was younger, starting to hear a lot of folks in my age bracket and younger who were genuinely afraid um, of the concept of having children. Uh, and this decision is not one that I have judgment for, nor do I not myself contemplate the same idea. Um, so I don't bring it up because it's a bad thing. But what concerned me and what, you know, as I was joining this movement, what concerned me was the reality of like what sort of future a young person can look forward to if we're constantly being told that we aren't doing enough or you know that we have only a sparse handful of years to completely turn every single thing around in our whole life to um, get us through. Um, or we're gonna start to see what some are calling the onset of apocalypse. So it's honestly really terrifying when you're in conversation around climate crisis all the time, but um, a lot of folks question like, what is there to be hopeful about? Um, and it's a hard, it's a hard, question to answer, I'd say, what gives me hope? Um, but I, there's a lot of things that give me hope and I'm constantly um, with other young folks who are, you know, we're having a hard time coming up with things to be hopeful um, for. Um, but when I think of what gives me hope, I'd say that people give me hope, the earth gives me hope. Um, we're, I think we're often told that the earth is collapsing in on itself because of our um, actions, but the earth will continue to be here. So the question is, will we be here? Um, and so that's kind of where I, where I, where I live right there is, is what do we do um, once all of this, you know, moves to our next phase. Um, young people give me hope. Tiny little kids give me insane amounts of hope and pure elation and questions that my young adult brain still needs to figure out a way to answer one way or another. Um, I have three-year-old nephew and he is like going to be a future world changer. But um, I, my niche is two and three-year-olds, y'all, and I work with high schoolers. So, you know, young people, young people carry me through. Um, I think that things that we can't answer also gives me hope when I think about it. Um, we're experiencing different versions of an era where we have access to the answer for almost anything you could think of, anything you could think to ask or didn't even think to ask. And then you stumble upon it and you're like, I didn't even know I needed to know that, but this is the era we're in. Um, so if you have access to a phone or the internet, um, it's always been, you know, 
we were able to mitigate wonder um, now by looking up literally anything. Um, but the last few years have really, left, especially since the pandemic, um, last few years have really left young folks and the rest of the world feeling as disconnected from everything as ever before. So um, we are so dedicated to a growth in understanding by any means necessary uh, that we've fallen out of relation to our environment. And for most of us, this is a purposeful and intentional result of racism and fear and systemic harm that have kept us disconnected from our environment. And so now we find ourselves needing to learn how to get back to nature. Um, so a lot of the work that I do focuses on, like I'd said, kids from my um, community that are intentionally and historically left out of conversations around climate or of being in connection with our environment. And so if we're learning how to get back to nature, um, you know, that's a massive overhaul that's got to happen. Um, and it calls for a lot of undoing conditioning in your body. So the idea of an ever expanding set of requirements, I'd say, to keep up with changing surroundings gives me hope. Um, we, have a, we have a capability to adapt as people, um, animals adapt, um, our environment adapts around us, nature adapts around us, and still we keep trying to find ways to one-up nature. So, you know, as we're getting back to traditional understandings and we're getting back to the way things should be, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but uh, it feels good and it feels right. Um, I think that I've found relative success, I'd say, in keeping what I, I've heard recently is called a supple mind. Um, and a supple mind is different from an open mind in that it's willing and open to shift its understanding upon the reception of new information. So I would call that another form of adaptation as well. Um, this, this form of adapting has allowed me to maintain hope in the face of what the um, IPCC or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has essentially informed us time and again is a point of no return. Um, that's just where we're at. So we're at that point, which is why I tend to address all of what's happening around the globe as a climate crisis. It is not just global warming. It's not just, you know, climate change. We're in a crisis right now among all the other crises. So, you know, there's a lot to tackle. Um, but my first job um, when I was 16 years old was a lifeguard. Um, I, after a year of doing that, I began teaching and coaching aquatics. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with people in a pool for my job since I was 17. And so in these 11 years, I've had really close personal contact with folks from as young as six months old and as old as about 85 plus. Um, and I work on addressing fear that's being held in the body. And fear is constantly playing a tug of war with our mind. And it, it's an environment, water, that feels like it's attacking you, you know. And so the work that I do, um, which constantly gives me hope and, you know, uplifts me and I'm able to put my skills and gifts into it is um, working to do away with what we're conditioned to do and what we're programmed to do. And it seems like for all this time, we've been programmed and conditioned to um, continue harm, even though it's not, it's not all of us whose fault it is. Um, so working with folks to, you know, reduce harm and to um, carry us through from what we're experiencing right now and what we're seeing all around us into this next phase of a new narrative. I'd say that that really gives me hope. So, you know, the, the opportunity to um, rewrite the narrative, because that's what we're doing every day. Um, we are rewriting what has been decided for us in advance. Um, and we are, you know, doing so not by power, not by might, but by spirit and community holds that spirit. So, um I think I'm rambling on and on, but you know, there's, I have lots to say. So um, I would say that that's what gives me hope. And it is an exhausting world that we live in, but you know, the ability to also play and frolic and, you know, spend time um, healing is incredibly hope, hope inducing and hopeful. So I really suggest everyone spend some time with kids.
they keep you humble. So humble and hopeful, <laughs> but I will pass it on to whoever's next. Thank you, Analia. And thank you for all that you are doing to help rewrite the narrative. We'll now turn to Alexa. Fantastic. Thank you, Analia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Reverend Brooks. Uh, my name is Alexa Howard. Um, I am a community organizer, both by profession and vocation, and have been organizing for the past 10 years um, in Minnesota. I'm also a mom of a five-year-old um, who is, uh, you know, my relationship with him is what grounds me and guides me in my work. Um, and I'm the lead organizer for an organization called Isaiah which uh, is a statewide organization, uh, multiracial, multi-faith vehicle for real people like you and me uh, to, to change their communities, uh, build a better world. Um, and my work has been focused on rural and small town communities, um, among other things, but that has been my heart in this work. Um, and this year, this is a uh, Big celebration. So this year, uh, we, with a very large coalition um, across the state of Minnesota, uh, we were able to win on a 100% clean, uh, carbon-free <laughs> requirement by 2040 in the state of Minnesota. So all electricity generated um, in Minnesota will have to be 100% carbon-free by 2040. Um, so I can feel all like almost 200 of you, hopefully celebrating that, maybe clapping a little bit for us. Um, thank you. It's a very big deal. This policy is among the five strongest in the country. Um, I want to say a couple more things about it, but this is not going to be a policy conversation, although I could send you all some resources to look into our bill. Um, but it, so we, we focused on decarbonizing the electricity sector first. Um, because that's important for decarbonizing other sectors. The bill included a prevailing wage requirement so that uh, livable wages would be paid to people who are doing the, the work of moving us towards renewable energy. Uh, it prioritizes Minnesota jobs and local jobs, and it prioritizes building uh, renewable energy in communities that will be retiring fossil fuel plants. So the worker justice local economy angle of our legislation was incredibly strong. Um, this was the first major bill to pass in the Minnesota 2023 legislative session. The first one. Well, second, uh, it, was, it was right up there, depending on like dates and anyways, it was in the top two, um, but it was followed by another pretty large set of victories, um, not all having to do with climate, uh, but I want to tell you about some of them. So uh, following 100% clean energy, we were able to pass uh, voting rights restoration for people who have served their time for a felony will now be able to vote even when they're on probation or parole in Minnesota. 55,000 people will be able to vote because of this work. Historic investments in our public schools and our child cares. We are on the cusp of winning in the next week, automatic voter registration. Um, we will be in Minnesota replacing all lead pipes in the state so that no Flint, Michigan could ever happen in Minnesota. We have passed free school meals for every child in public schools in Minnesota. We will be passing dedicated transit funding um, to support transit projects over the next decade and a paid family and medical leave program. If you're not paying attention to Minnesota, I suggest you do. We're in a historic moment. And in many of these victories, people of faith and congregations have been at the center. I want you to take that in for a moment. At the center not hiring callers for press conferences, not helpers, not people who show up on occasion, people of faith in Minnesota for many of the victories I just named were the architects, the strategists, the power behind the campaigns and essential for victory. I want you to ask yourself if that is true in your states. So how did we get here? In Minnesota, the 100% clean energy campaign was a five-year campaign, um, five years to get to the place of being able to win it in the first month of our legislative session. 
in my organization in Isaiah uh, in 2017, people of faith uh, in the fall of 2017 engaged over 4,000 people in 500 house meetings, inviting people from their congregations and their neighborhoods into their homes to have deep conversations about the kind of grief we heard about um, in, in the, in the key, keynote of this, of this conference. So uh, people spent time in grief, moved towards hope in these house meetings, pretty deep conversations. Those conversations led to building an agenda that had 100% clean energy at the center of it, among many of the things I just listed. People of faith and congregations decided to engage in elections. There are, of course, limitations and rules to how congregations and people of faith can engage in elections, but limitations and rules do not mean we can't. So we got creative and we built people power through our electoral work. In 2019, with this agenda in hand, we engaged 6,000 people in our legislative session in in-person meetings. This is pre-pandemic, remember? And in 2021, we had a 4,000 person meeting on Zoom with the governor of Minnesota. In those two years, 2019 and 2021, we passed the 100% clean energy bill in the house in Minnesota. So we got it ready, but it failed to move in the Senate. Behind the scenes of all of these big moments in organizing, we talk about peaks, a 4,000 person meeting with the governor, of which many of you all at Mayflower were at, hi Mayflower and everyone in Minnesota. Um, those are peaks, but the valleys are just as important in organizing. In the valleys, we built teams, we held retreats, we did listening campaigns of one-on-one -on -one conversations about our hopes and dreams. We had congregational forums, we led phone banks, we did canvassing, we did lobbying visits, all people of faith. And during this campaign, there was a lot of pain and a lot of loss. Uh, we did not expect that it would take five years. Some of us were, were hopeful that it would move faster. Um, so we, during that time, it was people of faith who kept building, believing that something better was possible, even though it seemed impossible in the moment. And that is what hope looks like in Minnesota. And because of that hope and because of those valleys and because of that building, we were ready in 2023 when it became possible. And that is why it was one of the first two things to pass. So I wanna give some advice for people of faith who are doing organizing, which I know all of you on this call fit, fit in that category in some way, shape or form, or you wouldn't be here. Um, first, I wanna name a couple traps that we fall into just as people in doing this work, traps that stop us from moving forward. The first trap is a, uh, everything is broken, it's all bad kind of thinking. And I can and we can understand how we get here, right? Nothing will ever change, things are too broken. This is a trap of despair and cynicism that lets us off the hook from doing anything to make a better world possible. There's another trap on the other side, which is it's all good thinking. Things will sort themselves out. Things will get better. We will be fine. Or another way I've seen this look more lately is I'm doing enough. I'm doing enough to soothe myself that my part is done. Check that box. Climb, do, doing some work on clean energy, check that box. Instead of asking ourselves what is actually required of us in this moment. Both of these traps the like, it's all bad and broken, burn it all down, and it's gonna be fine. Alleviate ourselves of being, being responsible. They let us off the hook. Instead, I believe as people and as people of faith, we are called to walk the middle between these traps. Clear-eyed, sober understanding of the world as it is and the pain that exists and what we face married with a deep belief that a better world is possible and an understanding that we bring it about together and we are responsible. 
So for people of faith, I wanna encourage you to do a set of things. I want you to find organizations in your state that you can not only partner with as one of a dozen ministries in your congregation, but that you can co-own. This might not be one organization, it might be a few, but these are not organizations you once a year send a check to and maybe volunteer for. These are organizations like your congregations that you decide to use as your vehicle for public life, that you uh, become members of, that you wield, that you shape. No organization is perfect, neither are your congregations. Decide to own one or two or three. Prioritize building infrastructure that brings lay leaders into leadership, not just clergy. And clergy, don't do public actions without bringing along your lay leaders. Ask yourselves and push yourselves around impact. Are we making the difference we set out to make? If not, how do we? What is our strategy? What is our analysis of the big picture and what we're up against? And then make big asks of the people in your congregations. Don't say no for them, be invitational. So I wanna close with my favorite quote about hope because these are stories of hope. So that's wrapped up advice. Uh, Rebecca Solnit, who I think was brought up maybe earlier, um, says this quote, and this is what I'll close with. Hope is not a lottery ticket. You can sit on the sofa and clutch. Hope is an ax you break down doors with in an emergency. Hope should shove you out the door because it will take everything you have to steer the future away from endless war, from the annihilation of Earth's treasures and the grinding down of the poor and marginal. Hope just means another world might be possible, not promised. Hope calls for action. Action is impossible without hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexa, for all those nuggets of wisdom that you just gave to us. That is much appreciated. We'll now turn towards our third and final panelist for today. Gina, we await hearing from you. Hello everyone, how you doing? I'm Black Bear Clan. I'm Anishinaabe with the Turtle Mountain Pemina Band of Chippewa. My name is Gina Peltier. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, share my screen just to show you guys some pictures while I chat, um, if that is all right. Okay, I'm not sure, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, for time purposes, um, there's so much I wanna share with you, but I'll just go ahead and keep it short. Um, there is so much uncertainty going on in this world um, with climate change. In a time with so much despair, there is hope. And I'm going to share with you some of that um, today. I am with Honor the Earth and Honor the Earth wants to create awareness and support for native environmental issues and develop needed financial and political resources for the survival of sustainable native communities. Honor the Earth develops these resources by using music, the arts, the media and indigenous wisdom to ask people to recognize our joint dependency on the earth and to be a voice for those not heard. As a unique national native initiative, Honor the Earth works to raise public awareness and raise and direct funds to grassroots native environmental groups. They are the only native organization that provides both financial support and organizing support to native environmental initiatives. The model is based on strategic analysis of what is needed to forge change in Indian country. And it is based deep in our communities, histories and long-term struggles to protect the earth. You know, contrary to popular belief, Indigenous tribes that thrived on Turtle Island for tens of thousands of years weren't just no, weren't nomads that wandered the land. They built habitats that attracted animals. They never needed to use cages. The Nitsitapi, the Blackfoot tribe, did controlled burns on the landscapes. 
Specifically, they would burn the grass in one area that they wanted the buffalo to populate for the next year. This would be next year's hunting grounds. Hence, the black, why they were called Blackfeet is because of walking on all the burnt soot to cause the soot to stay on their moccasins. So some would say we are a key species. Indigenous tribes cultivate gardens and farm the land without taking any nutrients out of the soil. And today, the nutrients in the topsoil has depleted by 42% in the last 200 years. Scientists say in little over 10 years, if we continue with the industrial farming practices we use, there will be 50% nutrients in our topsoil. So we've witnessed the devastating effects of the construction of line three, when Enbridge fracked out toxic drilling fluids into over 22 river crossings and um, in over more than 200 bodies of fresh water. Line three is going through nearly half of North America's fresh water, which is super scary considering that water became a commodity on Wall Street in December of 2020, around the same time Minnesota Governor Walz approved of the permits for line three, meaning now people can make money off the scarcity of water. The beginning of June 2021, we could drink the river out of the Mississippi River near the headwaters and not get sick. Then Enbridge drilled under the Mississippi River in the same location and spilled toxic drilling fluid into our fresh water supply, killing our fish after they developed blisters. You can't even put your foot into the river in that area now without developing a rash. It's truly traumatizing to see that unfold in front of your eyes, being able to drink and swim in that river before Enbridge destroyed it. What's even heartbreaking is that we never needed fossil fuels to begin with. Y'all know Henry Ford's first automobiles ran off a of hemp fuel and the whole body was made of hemp steel, which is a thousand times stronger than the steel we use today. Imagine how many lives we could have saved if we were still allowed to use hemp. And no matter how much hemp you smoke, you can get, not get high off of it. Unfortunately, the oil barons, the cotton farmers, and the wood producers used racism to make hemp illegal. And you know, all the oil that is flowing through line three is being sold to China so China can make plastics out of it. Anything that's made out of plastic can be made out of hemp. There's so many things that can be made out of hemp. You know, how many potholes did you hit the last time you drove your car? Hempcrete is a thousand times more durable than the concrete you, we use today. Imagine if we were allowed to use hemp, there would be less potholes and there certainly wouldn't be as much road construction. So through food sovereignty and energy justice, we are bringing hope with the help of our sister organizations. We're known as Hemp and Heritage Farm, Ah King, Eighth Fire Solar, um, we have our Nimrod goat farm, we grow potatoes, we produce coffee, um, and then our Aking Eighth Wife, Anishinaabe Agricultural Institute. And as said earlier, you know, Exxon Mobil was fully aware of the link between fossil fuel emissions and global heating, but spent decades refuting and publicly attacking climate science and scientists in order to make maximum profit. Fossil fuel companies made trillions of dollars last year, not millions, not billions, but trillions. Well, you have over half of full-time working Americans not even being able to afford a one bedroom apartment like myself. Scientists predicted with breathtaking accuracy the disastrous climate path that is wreaking havoc across the globe because of their use of fossil fuels. We, already, we are already seeing it today with the tornadoes, the droughts, the wild, fires, the floods, they're all becoming even more worse. Global warming is causing the ice caps to melt faster than anticipated. Scientists say we have less than 10 years to make a drastic change. But that's why there is all this talk of hemp. Hemp can clean the air. It's an excellent carbon sequestration. One hectare of industrial hemp can absorb 15 tons of CO2 per hectare. Hemp's rapid growth makes it one of the fastest CO2 to biomass conversion tools available, more efficient than agroforestry. Hemp puts nutrients back into the soil. Hemp can help refresh deplete soil by restoring stability and nutrients to the area. 
Hemp roots grow deep very quickly, holding the soil together and protecting the area from erosion. When the plant is harvested, it is also leaves behind large amounts of biomass that can be left to decompose and enrich the soil once again. <laughs> there are so many uses for hemp. You can make clothes out of hemp, you can make houses out of hemp, you can even fuel your house or fill your cars and heat your houses out of hemp. You can make so many building materials out of hemp, you can even make paint out of hemp. So we cannot be focusing on the false solutions like carbon sequestration, nuclear incineration, or hydropower. We need to stop making compromises off the indigenous and BPOC life lives. That 100% bill is not 100% and it is sacrificing indigenous and BPOC people. We need to do the green new revolution right. So we also spread hope by being a leader in true clean energy, not only by educating people on hemp, we also um, have other endeavors such as producing solar energy and promoting food sovereignty. By producing food, you lose by producing food, you lose some of the need to purchase, which reduces the instability of your dollar in a time of climate change and rising oil prices. A small garden plot might put up a thousand dollars worth of food. If we moved from industrial agriculture to relocalized organic agriculture, we could sequester about one quarter of the carbon moving into the air which is part of destroying our glaciers, oceans, forests, and lands. And I don't know about y'all, but I love gardening. I just don't have the time for it because I'm working so much because even working 40 hours a week doesn't pay all my bills. But it's important for us to continue to take a stand and to work with and educate our communities of how they can help. That's why we work hard and we also hold a lot of events. Um, we had the Water is Life celebration this last September, where we had multiple artists come and perform and it brought thousands of people together and we were able to spread the good news and education on how important water is and what people can do to help protect that. Um, we have Shell River reunions, which is focused on healing because protecting the environment and being a water protector, you automatically have a target on your back and that is quite traumatizing the work you do. So we do like to hold events that focus around healing and faith and all that good stuff. Um, we have indigenous farming conferences and hemp conferences. And then this summer, we have the gathering at the Mississippi Headwaters, this June 2nd to the 4th, which is co-hosted by Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light and RISE Coalition. You know, people of faith and conscious are coming together to affirm indigenous sovereignty and nurture connections with our land, water, and all living creatures and learn about the real change being created through legislation and policies and other ways you can honor and respect one another and the earth. And you know, I really got it. I wanna share this with y'all um, because before 2020, it may be surprising to you, but um, I really hated everyone. I was in a really bad place. I had a really awful upbringing full of abuse and all that stuff. And the community I was raised in was very, harsh. Um, but when Standing Rock happened and I saw my sisters unarmed, nonviolent, fighting for everyone's water and being attacked by men three times their size and dogs who didn't care if they bit them and drew blood. I saw my sisters unarmed, nonviolent in fields protecting the water being attacked. And I knew that I could not just sit on my couch any longer and ignore what's happening around me. So ever since then, I took every chance and every opportunity I could to take a stand for Mother Earth and our community. And through that, I have found amazing people that have brought me to the place I am today. Um, a few years ago, you wouldn't have seen me talking in front of anyone about anything. I was happy and content being by myself in my home. Um, but joining this community of water protectors, I have seen so much love and support. And I seen that the fact that we are capable of doing so much better and we are capable of working as a community for the betterment of everyone. 
So we really do need less individualization and more community. And when we come together and work as a community, we can thrive as Mother Earth intended, and we can sustain our society in, for future generations. We are capable of doing better and a great future is possible. And one more thing I just wanna add um, before I let you all go is that I even talk to the people who change my oil about all this. I let them, I give them all the facts and, and, and all the information and I let them know like, you know, you're worth more than what you're getting paid, but at the same time, you know, we never needed to use oil and that they don't need to feel bad for it. They just need to educate themselves and work better towards a better future and, and let people know that there are better resources out there. You guys, I could go on all day long. So I'm just gonna go ahead and stop there. Thank you so much for listening and thank you everyone for caring about Mother Earth. Wow. This has been an amazing uh, panel. Uh, and let me say on a personal level, Gina and Analia, it's good to see you all again. Uh, so this has been powerful. And as we bring this to a close, I, I want to thank you all so much um, for your wisdom uh, that you brought and your experience and, and that uh, you are making a difference. Uh, each of you is truly a hope, of, a, a scope or so a source, excuse me, of hope. Now, Brooks, uh, how do we wrap up this incredible, incredible summit? Hey, thank you, Michael. I do think we've, we've got maybe some, some time here for uh, one or two questions for our panelists. So we'll, we'll uh, take an opportunity now for questions uh, from the audience and, and questions that are brought before us. Uh, all three of you are, are skilled organizers. So a question is, what are some core skills of being an organizer? Is it something that requires training or can anyone do it? Uh, t tell us what it, what it means to be an organizer and what it entails. Alexa, would you like to take the first stab at that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I think of community organizing as a craft that you apprentice yourself to with other people and can learn. Um, and, you know, the heart of organizing is building relationships. So uh, deep relationship building is something, again, that can be taught that you can go through training around. Um, and then understanding power is key to organizing, um, understanding how you build people power, how you engage in an analysis around how power is moving in your landscape. Um, Again, all of which I would encourage you all to seek out organizing trainings um, and opportunities to learn and build organizing skills and tools together. Every single person has the capacity to be an organizer. I'm an introvert. Some people think extroverts have to be, or, or you have to be an extrovert. It's not true. Um, but yes, seek out, seek out ways to learn from people in your states, in your communities. Um, I can piggyback on that. So, yeah, I would say that um, learning and being in a good space where you can actually start to understand the things that are affecting your community um, is how anyone can become a community organizer. Um, I think that a lot of us adults that are making programming for young people um, operate from an assumption that everyone wants to be a leader. Um, and something that I got at this youth conference that we were at for Power Shift um, two weeks ago um, was that not everyone needs to be a leader. We actually need some people to be followers. And that was the first time I'd heard that. Um, but, you know, if we operate from the understanding that everyone just inherently wants to, you know, be the change, I think that that is um, a little bit of an assumptive um and it's an assumptive thing that we do. Um, so I think starting to pay attention to what's happening to your community is a way that you can start to match your talents with organizing said community. Um, I did not think of myself as an activist growing up um, until I started doing this work. So, you know, how do we um, hold space for folks that didn't see themselves as an activist or don't see themselves as a change maker? but that have a very important set of um, lived experiences that qualify them to be in this space. 
Um, so yeah, I'd say learning what's happening in your community at present um, gives way to opportunity to address those things um, and to start writing some harms caused. But I think that um, everyone that is a part of community has an opportunity to become a community organizer. Um, and we also just have this massive crisis happening right now. We have many, like I'd said, overlapping multitudes of crises. Um, so there's some way to get involved in some regard. So um, whether it's a small thing or a big thing to you, I think just relations is at the forefront of everything. So really building relationships with folks helps as well. Uh, knowing that you all are, are speaking with uh communities of faith and people who are uh, overseeing or pastoring communities of faith. Where and how do we get started? Um, you show up. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you, you take it upon yourself to show up, seek out what's going on out there, see what's going on in your community. And if no one's doing anything, then you can just start um, organizing yourself. We all have different abilities and they are all um, valued in the movement, whether it is being a keyboard warrior or taking that arrest. Um, they're all important. I think the most important thing that I see in organizing is providing food. <laughs> Um, and then that too, you know, when the line three resistance started, you know, a lot of people didn't know about it. So a lot of people took it upon themselves to start their own um, rallies. I know a lot of people um, did uh, like um, Salsa Tuesdays where they danced in front of an Enbridge building and they um, provided food. Another group danced every Friday in front of a Wells Fargo building with their signs. Um, and it's not just, you know, organizing rallies, like I said, just show up and get involved, you know, showing up to this webinar is, is, is organizing and starting, you get to see who's out there working and stuff like that. And so I always say just show up and, and if no one's doing anything, start doing yourself, you know, I was part of a group who danced in front of Wells Fargo, and it started with three of us and it, and it turned out at the end there was over 40 of us showing up, which was quite interesting. And then you get to share with people what's going on. People come up to you and they ask and you just nice and politely start that conversation with them and share all of the facts and education, you know, um, being on the front lines and in the frontline resistance camps, you know, we were very open to talking to pipeliners that a lot of them didn't know exactly the harm they were causing and they didn't know that there were other jobs out there. Um, so a lot of the leaders were able to turn the pipeliners over to being a water protector and some of them quit their jobs. Um, but yeah, just show up and, and if no one is doing anything, take the initiative yourself. We all have skills that are very valuable. Thank you so much, Gina, for that. Uh, to pivot here to, uh, I guess, for Alexa or Analia, a uh, question. Both of you work for organizations that are, are kind of rooted in local faith communities. If you could share something about, you know, experiences you've had where you've seen faith communities kind of step up and you've just really appreciated the ways in which they've done something or taken the initiative on something or decided to, to be a follower on something. What are, what are some things that are really helpful uh, that you've seen kind of coming from faith communities and that you'd love to see more of? Is, are there some things that some words that you can put to that? Okay, um, sure, I can go first. Um, so like I said, all these uh, pretty incredible victories that we have either achieved or are on the cusp of achieving in Minnesota, um, not all, but many have been led by faith communities. And I think that's, again, because of decades of organizing in congregations. Um, and what I would say is, you know, again, talking about this valley work, what happens between peak moments is really key. So when faith communities only do peak moments, I would call that mobilization. Mobilization has its place, but how we till the soil, how we go deeper, um, the work of building teams, social justice teams, climate teams in our congregations is critical. 
And do those teams not just do book studies, which are fine and great and help us grow and learn, but also have an analysis, have a strategy, connect to powerful organizations in your state, in your county, in your city, and then decide to be responsible for impact, for passing the policy at your county, for changing that rule in your city. Um, that is when I see faith communities really shine and engaging your entire congregation in that conversation and in that process. Again, instead of, you know, I, I think showing up is absolutely right. And uh, to Gina's point, like that is your first step. And then decide to be responsible. When you show up, sign up, join the team, right? Um, and, and take those next steps. Um, I can just add really quick. So at MNIPL, we have what's called a theory of change. We have a theory of change that will, oh, y'all, it has been a long morning. We have a theory of change that is called the three-legged stool. Um, and so in order to see, you know, deep transformational shifts happening, um, you cannot have just one leg of the stool. Um, so the legs of the, the three legs of the stool are practical change, a relational or spiritual change, and a systemic changes. Um, and so I think that faith communities, you know, have tend to focus on the relational and spiritual aspect. Um, and now we're in this climate crisis. So folks are able to, you know, do something about the practical aspect of like reducing our carbon footprint and reducing our emissions. Um, but we also have this obligation and opportunity. Sorry, there's lots of young folks moving around me. Um, we have this kind of opportunity um, to an obligation to also address um, possible systemic changes. And so um, I've been working in the uh, international reparations conversation around loss and damage for um, the last six months. And, um, you know, we were able to get faith communities to get behind um, pushing our State Department and our Congress to um, not block progress on loss and damage. And just super, super quick, if you haven't heard of it, loss and damage is essentially looking at um, countries that have contributed the most to the climate crisis, starting to accept our fair share um, of what we've contributed to the climate crisis, because communities globally that have contributed the least are bearing the brunt of the worst aspects and the worst parts of the climate crisis. So um, I think faith communities have an opportunity to pressure um, our representatives and our people in power that um, have had a hand in getting us to this point um, and expecting to see some change. Um, we need to expect that, you know, the people that we've elected um, are going to do something to um, stop harming our communities. So to get people that have power and have wealth to put their money where their mouth is and um, affect some relational systemic and practical change. Um, I think faith communities have an opportunity to do that. So we were able to get a congressional letter um, penned and signed by uh, Representative Ilhan Omar to um, go to our State Department and influence a huge win at uh, the United Nations Conference COP27 to um, stop blocking progress on loss and damage. So when faith communities do actually get behind practical change as well, um, as relational and systemic, you know, and excuse me, and systemic change, um, we have an opportunity to really get some cool things done. Great. Thank you so much for those concluding comments. We, we do have to bring this to a, an end. I'm afraid this has been terrifically informative and enriching. Thank you so much to each of you, Gina, Alexa, and Analia. You have been terrific, and your stories and insights have been awesome.